Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. And if you're here for the first time, we trust and pray this service will be an encouragement to you and strengthen you as you seek to draw closer to Christ and walk in His ways. For those watching on our live stream broadcast, thank you for joining us for another Sunday morning, and we are thrilled and delighted to know you're there. Our call to worship this morning reminds us of why we gather on Sunday morning to worship the living God. And it comes from Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2. And after our call to worship, we'll sing that very popular, well-known hymn, In Christ Alone. Let's stand together for our call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day.
please be seated. And please join me as once again we unite our hearts and minds together as we enter the presence of God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, even as the refrain of our opening hymn continues to run through our minds this morning, we freely confess and delight in the certain assurance that in Christ alone our hope is found. And this morning as we gather, we gather to express our great love for Him, thanking You that You sent Your only begotten Son into the world that we might come to know You and walk with You all our days. And for this we do indeed thank You. And we ask this morning, as we often do, for Your presence in our midst. We're conscious that Jesus promised wherever two or three are gathered, I will be there in your midst. And this morning, may we sense your presence. May we be the recipients of your equipping and enabling grace as we open up your word and study it together and then seek to live it out in the course of this week. Father, whatever circumstances or situations we are facing in our individual lives and lives as a family, may we this morning be able to rest in you. For we ask these things in and through the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, we once again have the awesome privilege to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. And so it's my privilege to introduce to you Tim and Sarah Steele Schwab as they present their daughter, Erica Joy, for baptism. Erica, all these folks are here to say good morning to you. Well, this has been an incredible year for this couple. Not only in 2022 were they married, but it was also this year that they officially welcomed Erica Joy into their family. And so it's especially fitting that we would share this special moment of baptism with you today. I'm so honored to share it with you. Well, as we often talk about in the sacrament of baptism, the great Augustine calls it the outward and visible sign of a very inward and invisible grace, a sign and seal of incorporation into Christ and into his family. And all of that is just a formal way of saying that baptism is the Father's way to welcome someone new into his family. For we were all once, the word tells us, at one time separate from Christ, foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in this world. But through the sacrificial love of the Savior, we who were once far away have been adopted into his family and by his extravagant grace now receive all the rights and privileges of an heir and are able to call God Abba Father. And so each time we are privileged to share the story of baptism, we are remembering God's faithfulness in his covenant love to his people and are reminded once again of a Father in heaven who loves us greatly. And so often we wear white in baptism as a representation of putting on the fresh garment of Christ, and water is used as a symbol of washing away of sins. And so while Miss Erica doesn't fully understand all of this yet, today her parents, along with family and our church family, covenant to retell her the story of God's faithful love. And it is our hope and prayer that one day she will stand before a congregation such as this and profess her own faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Sarah Steele and Tim, having heard these promises of baptism, we have these questions for you. Do you confess your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord alone, do you? Do you promise in reliance on the grace of God to raise her in the nurture, wisdom, and admonition of our Lord Jesus, do you? We do. And finally, will you promise to pray for her, faithfully teaching her the word of God, and by your example, walk with her in the way of Christ, will you? We do. 
as a response to Sarah Steele and Tim's profession of faith here, may I invite you to stand for our covenant of faith as well. Covenant partners of First Presbyterian Church, do you recommit yourself to the teaching and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you promise to welcome this child into the church family by strongly encouraging and supporting her with your love and prayers as she grows in the nurture and wisdom and admonition of the Son, do you? Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we thank you that you are a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And we thank you that you are a ministry. You give us the ministry of your Son through this word and sacrament. And we ask now that you would set apart this water from a common to a holy use as a sign and symbol of your gracious cleansing work on the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. Miss Erica, this week we got to practice this. Can I hold you? And she was very curious about this right here. Erica Joy Schwab, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may God bless you today and every day. And may wherever the Holy Spirit take you, may your greatest treasure be your faith in Him and your love for God's people. Amen. Chris, will you lead us in a prayer? Good. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful world that we live in. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for your grace poured out upon us. Thank you for blessing Tim and Sarah with this beautiful child, Erica. We pray you would give Tim and Sarah strength and wisdom to raise Erica for your glory. Father, build and sustain bonds of love between Tim, Sarah, and Erica. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Draw them close together and close to you. We pray you would always be the center of their household the center of their relationships, the center of their lives. As she grows and matures, Father, use Erica in wonderful ways for your own good purposes. You have promised us all your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be peace with your children. We pray for that through you, Erica would grow happy, healthy, and strong. Father, give our congregation the hearts and resources to support Tim and Sarah Bless us with the gifts to love and nurture Erica as she grows closer to you. Father, we pray your great blessings upon Erica, Tim, and Sarah in the powerful name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Profess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Warmest congratulations to the Schwab family, and thank you for being with us for baptism this morning. It is just a delight to see you. One or two announcements for you this morning. If you would turn to the back page of your worship folder this morning, allow me to highlight one or two events coming up. And once again, to say a very warm welcome if you're here for the first time. And each Sunday morning, you hear us saying pretty much the same thing at this part in the service, and it's this. If you are visiting and want to keep in touch with us as a congregation, or you're interested in the ministries and programs we have and how we serve those in need in the Greenville community, you can text 
text the number on the screen. You'll see it in print in front of you there. And this allows us as a congregation to keep in touch with you. And that's proven to be very handy over the last two and a half years as we've used it. So if you want to stay in touch with us, that's a good number to text. And we will update you from time to time on all that's happening here at First Press. Immediately below that, you will see it's Hollis Academy Book Drive. We've been mentioning this over the last few weeks, and the idea behind this book drive is simply this. As children go back to school at Hollis, as a congregation, we have committed to purchasing books to put in their media center and in their library. And so on the way out this morning, you'll see in Fellowship Hall, little leaflets, pull one off of the display that's there. There will be the name of a book and an author. Pick up that book and return it next Sunday morning. All the details are printed there. August 21, I think, is the deadline. So we've got a couple of weeks, but if you would uh, participate in that, the children at Hollis would be uh, most appreciative. And it's hard to imagine that investing in books, hard to imagine anything better than investing in books and teaching these wee ones to read and appreciate literature. So that's uh, today, please. Below that again, you'll see re-engage marriages coming up. It's a 15-week marriage enrichment ministry. Uh, the course is beginning on Wednesday evenings, both here in the church and on Zoom. So please, all the details are printed there for you. There is various uh, times and places, so please take note of that. Claire, have I covered everything there? or thereabouts. Claire's looking at me saying, encourage the congregation just to read the announcement. They'll get it clear. Thank you, Claire. Uh, we have an Alpha course coming up beginning August 17. And if you read the announcement, you'll get everything there. So th that's good. And then we have Lemonade and Learning coming up beginning Tuesday morning, August 9. And our youth basketball sign-ups. If you have children or grandchildren participating in basketball, that's coming up shortly as well as the summer, believe it or not, is beginning to to slip away. Our children will be back in school in a couple of weeks as we move beyond the summer into the fall period. So that's all of our announcements there. Each Sunday morning as we uplift the offering, we do so intentionally. And it's an opportunity for us as congruents to give back, and to give back prayerfully and generously, and to support all of the ministries we're involved in here at First Pres. And as we do, let's worship God.
Let us pray. Father, in coming to you in prayer, there is a very real sense in which we run into your arms and sense the warmth of your love as you wrap us in your arms of love and care. And this morning, as we bring our offering to you, we ask, as we often do, you would bless it, multiply it, and enable us to care for those in need in and around the Greenville community. And Father, first and foremost, we pray for that community this morning. And we think especially as we come towards the final days of summer holidays for teachers and those involved in education, we ask that you would equip and enable each one to fulfill the call that you have given to them as they take into their care each day our children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. May each of them have an outstanding academic year beginning in a few weeks. May each have a teacher dedicated to the education and maturing of each child. May classes be filled with moments of both information and transformation as our children grow and develop, both educationally and psychologically and emotionally. And above all things, we ask that you would presence yourself in each classroom, inspire, encourage, and strengthen each teacher, each head teacher, each administrator, those for whom a call to education is a living reality each day. And may you keep our children safe and bless and encourage them, drawing them close to you, that they would sense your presence and your grace upon their lives. And Father, as we pray for our children, we also pray for those in our families in need, some wrestling with COVID, some grieving the death of a parent and a grandparent, a spouse, others acting as full-time caregivers, giving so much, caring so much, that at times they themselves feel a little harassed, under pressure, unsure how to care more, physically tired, at times exhausted. Father, may you once again, through your Holy Spirit, presence yourself in their homes and in their lives and grant to them all of the resources they need, a mighty, energizing faith Faith that will see you in the midst of those moments of struggle and difficulty. Sense your hand upon them as they are tempted to feel overwhelmed and out of touch. And so, Father, we ask that you would indeed bless each one of them. And so, Father, this morning, as we bring this prayer time to a close, we ask that the prayer that you taught the Lord Jesus Christ to teach to his disciples would be a living reality for us this morning. And so together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment or two, we're going to open up and study God's Word together. And that plays an essential part in our service on a Sunday morning, as we believe that learning and knowing those biblical principles help transform our lives as we seek to live out our faith day by day. And so before we come to the study of God's Word, our hymn of preparation this morning is entitled Matchless Grace. And as we sing it, you will immediately recognize the tune. We have sung it a few times in the past. 
last. The first verse focuses on the Father, the second on the Son, and the third on the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together as we sing Matchless Grace. <laughs> scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're reading verses 1 to 18. And you'll find it on page 418 of the Church Pew Bible, page 418. If you're watching from home this morning and watching for the first time on Sunday morning when we pause together to open up and study God's Word, it's a good idea if you do the same at home. So in future Sundays, please have a Bible ready uh, to open up and follow with us as we study God's Word together, because we are convinced of the importance and the centrality of putting God's Word first and foremost in our lives. It's a fairly lengthy reading this morning, and as I was preparing this past week, I thought, are there any parts I can leave out? And as I looked at it and looked at it and reread it, there isn't. So please be patient with me as we read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah son of Joraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other Penanna. Penanna had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. 
And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? And once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept and prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give to him the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Amen. And we trust that God will bless to us this reading of His Holy Word. A couple of weeks ago, someone sent me an email that I thought was so good, I wanted to share it this morning. And the email said, if you serve your children frozen pizza or chicken nuggets for dinner, you may be in danger of becoming a terrible parent. It doesn't matter how busy you are, please find the time to microwave the food before you serve it. Now we read that and smile. And I was hoping you would smile more than that, but nonetheless, we read it and smile. Because when it begins, we think we know the direction it's going in. And then there's a twist, and it ends up in a very different place than what we first imagined. When you initially read it, you think this is an email about healthy eating for children, and in fact, all it is is humor. And why am I beginning with this this morning? Well, simply this reason. As you come to Scripture again and again, you often come across a narrative of someone like Hannah, or Jacob, or Joseph, or David, or so many others. And it seems both for them and for you as you initially read that passage that God is taking them in a particular direction only to discover, in fact, He's taking them in another direction entirely. And we see that again and again and again from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And that's exactly what we're going to see this morning. Now, most of you who worship with us regularly, and if you join us both here in the United States and overseas on our live stream, you will know that whenever we come to open up the Scriptures and come to a new passage, it is always helpful to look at the context of that passage. And Old Testament scholars tell us of the book of 1 Samuel several things. And the first they tell us is this, that it took place approximately around the year 1050 B.C. So that's more than 3,000 years ago. That's a long way back in history. Secondly, in terms of the Old Testament canon, it's preceded by Ruth and the book of Judges. And so, as it takes place in the context of that wider uh, cultural historical setting, it's helpful to know that during the time of the judges, judges were military leaders. They were also local rulers, administering political and legal justice. They were involved in sorting out civil strife, occasionally national upheaval, and international concerns. And these were the issues that were dominant 
dominating the people of Israel at that time. We're also told that it was a period of lawlessness, chaos in Israel, and you have that very famous passage at the end of the book of Judges, and everyone did fit, excuse me, everyone did as he saw fit. And so the people of Israel were beginning to look at their neighbors and ask themselves, how come our neighboring nations are developing economically and in terms of trade and import and export and agriculture and fishing? Why are we not prospering the way they are? And so there came a popular cry and consensus for a king, because they began to be convinced that if only they had a king like the other nations, the king would bring bring structure to government, structure to the economy. Things would begin to prosper. They would begin to do well. And these were all of the questions running through their mind. Israel at that point was beginning to leave behind the days of Well, I think the best way to say it is this. They're emerging from being an indigenous regional authority to being a nation. And they wanted to merge together. They believed, of course, there was strength in numbers. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were leaving behind indigenous clans and tribes and becoming a united nation. And here is my question to you this morning, having described all that. If you were alive back then, and you were asked to write about the cultural, political, historical context of the day, what would you write? Where would you begin? Would you begin that it's been 200 years since the death of Moses and Joshua, and here is an emerging nation? Is that how you would begin? beginning to highlight the political, social, national, and international issues of the day? And if going back 3,000 years is too much, let me try and make it a little easier. In 1774, the First Continental Congress took place in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. They met September 5th through October the 6th, representatives of 12 of Britain's 13 American colonies gathered to discuss the issues of the day. And if you were writing back then, you might write or discuss the future, excuse me, the American colony's future under growing British aggression. You might talk about the Stamp Act of 1765, He would highlight the Tea Act of 1773, the Boston Tea Party later that year, the British Parliament's enactment of the Coercive Act of 1774. And as you write a history of those early days of the United States, I suspect these are a number of the issues that you would highlight. And of course, you would want to explain that popular motif of the day, no taxation without representation. Please notice this, both in 1 Samuel and in 1774, we naturally imagine how they would write, but that's not how 1 Samuel begins. It doesn't begin with the national issues of the day, the major concerns of the nation. It doesn't mention import, export taxes. It doesn't mention fishing and agriculture. It doesn't mention this emerging nation. It begins in this rather strange way. There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jero, Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one called Hannah, the other Peninnah, or Peninnah rather. So my question is this. Why doesn't the book of Samuel begin with describing the historical, political, social context of the day? And my second question is this. In reading this passage of seemingly unfamiliar names from unpronounceable places, 
Does it remind you of anywhere else in Scripture where a book becomes the gateway into the next chapter of the people of Israel? Does it remind you of these words? Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah. Judah was Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. And whenever we come to a list of names in Scripture, the temptation is to quickly read through those names and dismiss them because they come across as seemingly insignificant and instantly forgettable. And yet, they're right there in Scripture. God included them for a reason. And the question is, why does God not inspired the writer to 1 Samuel to begin with the political, social, historical context of the day. Why doesn't he describe the other nations and how prosperous they were and the ambition of the people of Israel to become just like them? But he begins with a list of people. And Matthew's gospel the gateway in to the salvation of humanity and the unfolding of God's redemptive purposes in the New Testament begins with a list of names. Why? For this reason, that in the eyes of God, no one is insignificant or instantly forgettable. Because God delights to work in and through individuals, individuals whom He wraps His arms around, individuals whom He shapes and fashions after His own purpose and will. And that's what Matthew is telling us, that God never works in a vacuum. He does work in a historical context, but often through the lives of those who are seemingly insignificant instantly forgettable, those with unpronounceable names from unfamiliar places, God delights to change and transform. And likewise, in the book of Samuel, and whenever you come across a list of names, take a breath, slow down, because God is usually about to do something extraordinary. And that's exactly what is happening here. God is on the move. I mentioned moments ago it's been 200 years since the death of Moses and Joshua. God is about to take them into the next chapter of His unfolding redemptive purposes for the people of Israel, and never in a vacuum. And as the narrative unfolds, we also notice verse 3, year after year, this man went up, that's Elkanah, from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. And that was a centrally recognized point where various times in the year, people from all over Israel would go to Shiloh to enter into the festivals and festivities and offer worship and sacrifice to God. And that's exactly what happened. And they would bring animals to sacrifice. And of course, they would then uh, use doves, pigeons, sheep, a young goat, and whatever was being sacrificed to the Lord, they would hold back a little for a family meal. And as you can imagine, when Hannah and Elkanah arrived in Shiloh, they would sit down with cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents. And if in your mind you are thinking Thanksgiving and Christmas, where we gather around the table and enjoy each other's company and catch up with each other, that's exactly the situation that's happening here. But the backdrop to this story is this. Elkanah, who had two wives. And frankly, I think that was his first mistake. But nonetheless, he had two wives, Hannah and Penanai. Hannah had no children. Penanai had multiple children. 
And if you have ever longed for children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or you know someone who has, and nature has not blessed them in this way, you may know a little about the pain and sense of grief that comes with an inability to have children. And Penina was not the most supportive of Hannah. In fact, she was the opposite of that. She constantly taunted her and teased her about her inability to have children. And gathering as a family does not help Hannah when they gather for worship in Shiloh. Now, it's not that Hannah isn't a devout individual. She clearly is. But when families get together, all she could see was these wee ones running around and having fun. And I wonder if her heart wasn't breaking. And I suspect it was as she looked at them and inwardly prayed, Father, why on earth can't I have children? Why can't I be like Penina? Why can't I have a wee one to hold? and to care for and feed and watch grow and express my love to? Would it spoil some vast eternal plan, if I can quote the old song? She longed for children. The passage tells us that Pen and I taunted her. And I wonder if Pen and I wouldn't say to her, Hannah, Is there some kind of hidden sin in your life? Because after all, children are God's blessing to us. And if he hasn't blessed you with children, perhaps he's taken his hand of blessing off of you. And this is his judgment upon you. And Elkanah, Hannah, you need to look deep within your own soul. And I can imagine that conversation taking place. And do you think that's supporting Hannah, encouraging her in her faith? It's the very opposite. And Hannah is grieving and hurting, distraught. And you can imagine the pain there. And so Elkanah, noticing this, gives to his wife a double portion, trying to help her. But Hannah, of course, as you know, is deeply wounded. And so my question is this, and sometimes this happens on Sunday morning. Someone will come to worship struggling with an issue in their life and will leave a worship service not helped, but in fact discouraged. Will leave a worship service feeling worse than when they came in will leave a worship service grief-stricken and broken-hearted, and sometimes it's because a divorce is taking place, and it has absolutely devastated the person involved. In other situations, it could be the circumstances leading up to an abortion. And years later, the grief and hurt and pain and sadness becomes unbearable. Or it could be a sense of bereavement after an affair. And coming to worship isn't helping. What it's doing is it's making you feel worse. And you look back and say, if only, why didn't I? How can I possibly get over this? And if that describes you or someone you know or you're watching this morning and experiencing exactly what I've described, please, please, please hear this. There is no place so dark he cannot reach you with his love. There is no regret so debilitating that he cannot renew and refresh you. There's no mistake in the past that he cannot, by his grace, bind up that wound and make you whole again. Please do not allow past mistakes to define who you are. 
because this is the place to deal with them. This is the place to bring them and leave them in front of the communion table and put the past behind you, those regrets, those if-onlys, and allow His love and grace to welcome you and embrace that love and allow Him to whisper deep into your soul, I've got you. I've got you. You're mine. That's exactly what Hannah was about to experience. Because in the midst of all of her grief, all of her hurt, all of her pain, all of her sense of failure, and I think that was self-imposed failure, when she goes into what was, in essence, a large tent known as a tabernacle, the place of God to worship, she breaks down, and she cries out to God. She's holding nothing back, and her heart and mind and soul is exposed to His love and His grace. And of course, God hears her, and in His perfect timing and sovereign pleasure, He answers her prayer right then. But she doesn't know it. And over here is Eli. Eli is the priest who looks after the place called Shiloh, along with his sons. And he sees Hannah distraught in prayer, and his conclusion is she has been drinking. And I wonder if Eli has in the past experienced folks who come to family gatherings and festivals and events in and around the Shiloh area. They have too much to drink, yet know there is an obligation to worship, and they turn up under the influence. And here is Eli thinking, oh, it's happened again. And when he rebukes Hannah, Hannah says, no, that's not so. I am crying out from deep in my heart. And Hannah is willing to deal with the issues. She opens herself up. Every recess of her heart and soul is transparent to God. And we know that is real, genuine, heartfelt prayer as she's wrestling with God Himself. And Eli, in beginning to understand what happens, gives her a blessing, and off she goes. And when Hannah is wrestling in prayer, several things happen all at once. And we touched on this several months ago as we spent the first few Sundays of January looking at prayer. And remember back then, this is what we said. When we pray with intensity, we break away from mediocrity. We absolutely do. Secondly, when we pray with regularity, God becomes our priority, not ourselves. And our prayer becomes, what's that old phrase, thy will be done, not my will be done? And thirdly, when we pray in a quiet and solitary manner, we become profoundly dependent on Him. And that's what was happening with Hannah. And prayer reminds and defines who we are. We are a people of prayer, created for intimacy with God, for a super dependency, a profound dependency on Him. And that's exactly where Hannah goes. And notice this. In prayer, her focus is no longer on herself, but on God. For us, when we're going through challenging and difficult days, we're so often focused on the problem, our focus is not on Him, but on the problem. And how many times have we said it this year already? Prayer is not always about getting. It's often about becoming and being. Becoming dependent on Him. On being dependent on Him, and trusting Him for whatever the answer is. And that's exactly what's going on with Hannah. 
And the other thing we said earlier this year was this, that the Christian life is often shaped and fashioned in the quiet surrender of a selfless life prayerfully given over to Him each day. It is the quiet, unseen moments of prayer that move us to obedience and holiness that enables us to be individuals of prayer. That happens in prayer. It happened with Hannah as she gave over in all of its entirety her cares and concerns to God. And so, as we begin to wrap all of this up this morning, what have we learned? Several things. Number one, Hannah was to discover that her greatest challenge became her greatest blessing. Now, think of that. Her greatest challenge became her greatest blessing because the challenge shaped and fashioned her in the purposes of God. And she would become mum to Samuel. Secondly, the seemingly instant, instantly forgettable and seemingly insignificant lay at the center of God's purpose and will. And when you are tempted to think, I am a nobody, I have nothing to offer, why on earth would God even consider answering my prayers, never mind working in my life, please remember, Abraham, what? Begat, let me make it right, Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and it goes on and on and on and on. When you are tempted to think he's given up on you or forgotten you, come back to 1 Samuel, relearn the lessons. And thirdly, there is no place so dark, so painful, so debilitating that his love cannot reach you. That's exactly what's going on here. So, this week, as you move into a new week, and in fact, into a new month, if you're wrestling and struggling with issues, you can leave them in the presence of God as Hannah did because remember, Hannah did not get her answer to prayer that morning. It was nine months later she discovered an answer to prayer. Well, not quite nine, but heading in that direction. Because she learned above all things that her own inability was the starting place of God's love and blessing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture this morning. And thank you that it speaks forcibly into our lives. We ask, O oh God, that you would take it and apply it into our own circumstances. And may we sense your presence with us and your hand upon us in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is one of those hymns that we have been singing for generations. It's a wonderful hymn, and it asks the question, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let's stand together and worship.
at the end of a service on Sunday morning, our elder prayer team gather right here in the chancel area. And if you are wrestling with an issue, struggling to understand where is God at work in your life, our elder prayer team will be glad to pray with you and talk with you. Thank you to those who joined us on our live stream broadcast. We deeply appreciate you being with us this morning and look forward to welcoming you again next Sunday. Now let us pray together. And now may the blessing of God the Father, the Almighty, may the eternal love of Christ the Son, and may the peace and transforming presence of God the Holy Spirit rest and remain upon each one of us, both now and always. Amen. Please be seated.